She's been gone quite a while, eh? Nah, yeah, she's sweet. <laughs> All right, folks, welcome back. So in our last video, we ended with a hashtag puzzle. What does Oaken mean by dignity equal to that of men and as freely chosen lives as men? If she means that within a culture, women's choices should be equal to men within that same culture, Kimlika would respond, yeah, I've, I've already been there for a while. I planted my flag in that argument a long time ago. But if what she means is that women must have dignity equal to and as freely chosen lives as men in Western cultures, then she's arguing for a single uniform standard of what it means to be free. Now, one way we can figure out what Oaken means by these words, in other words, work through our hashtag puzzle, is to see why it is that she shows hostility towards Kimlicka's views. It seems, again, that their tasks could be complementary, with Oaken just sort of reminding us that illiberal practices of some cultural groups may be more deep-seated than Kimlicka really realizes and might require more proactive interference in order to change. Oaken says this about Kimlicka on pages 21 to 22. Clearly, Kimlicka regards cultures that discriminate overtly and formally against women by denying them education or the right to vote or hold office as not deserving special rights. Or in other words, she's saying here, this far, our tasks seem to be the same. But sex discrimination is often far less overt, she says. In many cultures, strict control of women is enforced in the private sphere by the authority of either actual or symbolic fathers, often acting through or with the complicity of the older women of the culture. And that last little bit there is gonna wrap around at the end of this video as part of her explanation for why she can't trust the voices of women within these cultures. And keeping on this theme of how their tasks might be similar, she admits that Kimlicka also recognizes this informal and private subordination at times, so perhaps she just wants to extend his argument. In fact, Oaken herself, as Kimlicka says in his response essay, has often come down on the side of special differentiated rights within the majority culture, when such special differentiated rights would help women achieve equality of individual rights. So for instance, in a 1990 book that she wrote called Justice, Gender, and the Family, she suggested, among other things, that women be given formal control of, say, half of a family's bank account, no matter who was the, quote, breadwinner within a family. And her concern was that many women have to stay in abusive and otherwise degrading relationships because they don't have the resources to leave if they're caretakers, not breadwinners. So she wanted to give women a special right over what was at the time considered their husband's, quote, property. So there's no initial reason to think that Oaken would be averse to the argument for special rights per se. And again, the early part of her essay does seem to have a tone of sort of supplementing Kimlicka's special rights-based argument. But as the argument moves along, it becomes more and more clear that Oaken is strongly opposed to most, perhaps all, special rights arguments when it comes to culture. Instead, at times at least, she seems to want to completely break down the walls of minority cultures so that the women within those cultures can escape them, or at least have the chance to escape them, and to escape practices that Oaken herself considers just backwards. And in fact, just doing textual analysis, we could have already seen this in the criticism of Kimlicka that I just talked about on page 21 to 22. She admits that Kimlicka recognizes informal discrimination. And she says he does indeed state a no sex discrimination rule for minority cultures. Yet, she's actually criticizing him for not using this criteria when he grants group rights. And here's a potential key to our hashtag puzzle. 
she adds to her criticism of Kimika that by his own lights, quote, no culture in the world, minority or majority, could pass his no sex discrimination test if it were applied in the private sphere. And so it seems increasingly throughout the essay that maybe she wants no sex discrimination as a rule to be applied not to grant group rights, but as a standard that all cultures have to uniformly meet. They all have to meet inside the culture. To her critics, she seems to want women within minority cultures to have the same number of opportunities open to them that exist within the majority Western culture, even if that means breaking down the cultural context in which they find their meanings to begin. And this strain of her argument begins innocuously enough as well. For example, after speaking of cultural defenses that have been offered in courts within Western societies, have been offered in America as well, cultural defenses for such practices as marriage by capture or honor killings. Oaken says on page 20, when a woman from a more patriarchal culture comes to the United States or some other Western basically liberal state, why should she be less protected from male violence than other women are? Okay, fair enough. But then eventually she's actually extending this argument, clearly implying that for women from minority cultures, the policy really that's going to give them the most freedom will be to incorporate them in some sense into the majority culture. Oh, she recognizes that majority Western culture isn't without its problems on issues of women's rights, but she says it is superior to all other cultures on this account. As she says on page 16, while virtually all of the world's cultures have distinctly patriarchal pasts, some, mostly though by no means exclusively Western liberal cultures, have departed far further from them than others. Now this is what puts the opponents of her work and even Kimlicka on guard to a certain extent. Rather than arguing in Kimlicka's vein that cultures enhance freedom and that they ought to be preserved to the extent that they enhance freedom, she seems to hold out the idea that there is one culture of freedom with the rest of them being inferior and expendable on that account. And this is what opens her to those charges of liberal imperialism. Homi Baba suggests in his essay that Oaken holds up freedom as really the only worthwhile value, and even more so, the peculiar Western version of freedom as quantity of choice. And he says that she seems to have very little humility in judging all other cultures according to how much choice they actually offer to women in comparison to Western cultures. And it's important to note that her argument isn't confined, at least, to women from more patriarchal cultures who come to a place like the United States, as in that quote that I just used a second ago, she suggests, especially in her example about female genital cutting and other of her examples, that she'd apply the same standard to anyone, even outside of Western countries. And even worse, as far as her critics are concerned, at least, Oaken seems to degenerate at times into sort of ad hominem attacks on these other cultures' practices things that she considers abhorrent. So on pages 17 to 20, her section that's entitled group rights, question mark, is less an analysis of the concept of group rights than it's a listing of all of the horrible hashtag issues that she thinks other cultures have in their treatment of women, other cultures have in their treatment of women. Some of these practices she even calls barbaric. That's hardly to her critics, the picture of cultural respect. She seems to them to believe a sort of combination of two different things. One, that a culture that extends more choice is always a better culture. And or two, that a culture is better in which these barbaric practices simply aren't carried out. And with this, we can circle back to our hashtag puzzle one more time. Remember, it's actually in her definition of feminism from pages 10 to 11. She says this, by feminism, I mean the belief that women should not be disadvantaged by their sex, that they should be recognized as having human dignity equal to that of men, and that they should have the opportunity to live as fulfilling and as freely chosen lives as men can. Now it becomes apparent to her critics, looking at the hashtag issues that she covers in that section, group rights, question mark, that the emphasis in those earlier words was less on the equality part, like as freely chosen lives as men, and it was more actually on the freedom aspect. When she says 
freely chosen lives, she has in mind something much more like the enlightenment vision of autonomous human beings. That vision that Clifford Geertz had criticized, according to which a culture is really just a pair of clothes that a person puts on and can take off at their choice. She seems perhaps to be saying that freedom means really taking off all of these cultural constraints to the greatest degree possible. So perhaps Oaken doesn't think of traditional cultures as Kimlicka really does, as contexts of choice, but in some sense as hindrances to choice. As she argues on page 22, it may not be enough for a person to be free that they have various meaningful social roles available to them from within their own culture, as Kimlicka thinks. Instead, she says, at least as pertinent to our capacity to question our social roles is whether our culture instills in us and forces on us particular social roles. To the extent that a girl's culture is patriarchal, in both these respects, her healthy development is in danger. So culture, in this quote, forces social roles on women. And to that extent, she says, it makes them unfree. In the passage of the essay that makes her opponents most angry, Oaken writes on pages 22 to 23, in the case of a more patriarchal minority culture, in the context of a less patriarchal majority culture, no argument can be made on the basis of self-respect or freedom that the female members of the culture have a clear interest in its preservation. Indeed, they might be much better off if the culture into which they were born were to become extinct so that its members would become integrated into the less sexist surrounding culture. Of course, Oaken follows up this rather jarring quote about cultural extinction by saying, well, she does think it would be quote, preferable if such a patriarchal culture were encouraged to alter itself so as to reinforce the equality of women. But still, even in doing this, she reinforces that she'd use Western culture as the standard because she says, reinforce the equality of women at least to the degree to which this value is upheld in the majority culture. So does Oaken want women to enjoy equal power within their cultures or does she want minority cultures with practices she considers barbaric to go extinct because cultures are basically just hindrances to the freedom of women to begin with? The linkage between those two possibilities, between the two different readings of her work is probably this. She never really considers, she doesn't think it plausible that given equal social power, what women will do is actually endorse some of the practices that Oaken herself considers barbaric, or at least, as she says, sometimes backward. Practices like veiling or arranged marriages and etc. Sandra Gilman, in his response to Oaken's essay, even suggests that the women in some minority cultures might endorse the practice of clitoridectomy, aka female circumcision, female genital cutting, or female genital mutilation. That's a hashtag issue that you and I will consider together in class. But I wanna close this video with a question. How would we know if they endorse these practices? That's the question Sarah Song takes up on page 83 of her piece that's on the syllabus. Oaken says very clearly in the essay that you read that you can't just ask the women themselves because they are already under the unfree sway of their culture. They've already been forced to accept these practices and as I said in that quote that I read earlier, that she thinks that the older women of the culture might actually be complicit with the men of the culture in reinforcing these practices. And then Song uses another open quote from another essay of hers saying this, a state that values liberalism above all would have no more need to consult with the women of such a group than it need consult with slaves before it insisted upon their emancipation or with workers before it insisted upon their protection from deadly workplace hazards. And for sure with this quote, our hashtag puzzle just gets deeper. What does she mean equating the women within minority cultures to slaves? But Sarah Song says, you do indeed need to consult. She says, and the argument is not unlike Iris Marion Young, so you could kind of use the two together. She says, look, what you need to do is you need to equalize the power to speak. You need to get women who've been marginalized into the conversation. You need to create genuine conditions for their entry into public deliberation, as she calls it, and therefore for their justice claims to be heard. And then Song says, where such conditions are met, we are less likely to be concerned that women have been forced to endorse traditional group practices.
even in cases where such conditions ensuring fair deliberation are not met, cultural dissent is much more common than Oaken suggests. So that's what we're gonna take up together in class, folks. What are the conditions necessary for us to be confident that some cultural value that a person endorses is really, truly, and freely endorsed by them? I look forward to talking about that with you in class. I'll see you then.